Hello, hi everyone. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of VoiceLessons.com. With me today, I have Matt. Hey, glad to Matt, be here. Thanks for tuning in. Whoa, almost spilled my water. Okay, so we're live. It's Thursday. We're a little bit uh, late. There's some always when you go live. There's always a technical thing. So here we go. We are live, and we've got some questions for you. Let me switch on over. I'm gonna put Matt up there and drop down over here. Okay. First question comes in from Kristen. I want to know more about placement and how that affects the sound and the way I am singing. Great. So Kristen, first of all, there are two things that contribute to placement, the way the vocal folds are vibrating and then the vocal track, which is everything from the opening of the vocal folds to the opening of the lips. So let's talk about the vocal folds first. Uh, I've got a model we're going to use here today that will give you a new insight that we haven't done before on the show here. But um, this is what a larynx looks like. Now, this is, of course, about like four times the size of a normal larynx. And what I love about this model is we can take it apart. <clears throat> Give me a second here as we disassemble a larynx. But when we disassemble the larynx, you can see what I'm talking about all the time when I say that as we sing, air travels up through the trachea and then it goes right past the vocal folds, which are right here. And as it passes between the vocal folds, so we have the vocal fold on that side, the vocal fold on this side, and when the larynx is together, they're uh, going up, the air is going up through that drop part of my larynx. But uh, the air is coming through the vocal folds, which are right down in there. And you can kind of see the white of the vocal folds. There you go. Okay. And when we set those vocal folds into vibration, there's a series of muscles that get involved that we call the intrinsic muscles. And those muscles help hold the vocal folds together. When we inhale, the vocal folds are apart. When we go to sing, those vocal folds are together. Now, if those vocal folds are just loosely pressed together, we get a breathy sound. Ah. And if they're firmly placed, uh, closed together, then we get a buzzy sound. Ah. Now, when you get a buzzy sound, you start producing frequencies above whatever it is that you're singing. And if we get strong enough frequencies, you might start to feel your bones vibrating as you sing. And that's what people often call forward placement. Now, the only way to really enhance those vibrations that are coming off of the vocal folds is to make changes in the vocal track. And this is what the vocal track looks like. And so again, here are the vocal folds there. Sound comes up from the vocal folds through the vocal tract, through the opening of the lips, and then it gets sent out into the room. This is the soft palate in the back. If it's down like this, the voice is going to be nasal, but if the soft palate is lifted, then the sound is just going to pass right through the mouth. Now, if you'll notice, right here we have this white, which is bone. And this white bone is what you actually, a lot of times, are uh, getting to start sending vibrations through. When you produce a strong enough sound and you amplify by the vowel quality, the brighter frequency, so you need a bright vowel quality usually, you're going to then get this bone uh, picking up some of the vibrations that are traveling to the vocal tract. And that bone, if you put your tongue on the roof of your mouth, you know, this is one of the main bones in your skull. It comes right up to here. You can keep tracing your fingers and feel that it covers all of what is traditionally called the mask, where people talk about hearing uh, frontal vibrations when they sing. And so those are the two things you need to have, firm vocal fold closure and a valve that's going to amplify the frequencies necessary to feel some sort of placement on the bone because the bone is right on the top of your vocal tract. Now, if you're not sure uh, whether or not your vocal folds are closed firmly enough together, uh, we're going to be talking about that a little bit later. Uh, so you can you know, stick around and we'll be talking a little bit more about registration tonight and all these things are going to apply to you. You're going to have to get the registration balanced out. But when it comes to the vowel, what you want to do is, first of all, make sure that you don't have any nasality in the sound. And so one of the best ways to test is when you're singing, close your nose shut. Now, you can't do this on consonants, but on vowels, if you're, close, uh, if you're pinching your nose shut and then you're singing, and all of a sudden you feel on certain vowel qualities that sound is getting blocked in your nasal cavity, then that tells you that soft palate is enough. That's the dangly little thing swinging in the back of your throat. And uh, you need to get that lifted up and out of the way to make sure that it's only your mouth that is participating and creating resonance for your singing. And then what you want to do is move your jaw, lips, and tongue until you start getting a vowel quality where you feel that ring come into it. So if I'm going, oh, everything's really tight and I don't feel any frontal vibrations. 
But if I start to play with that, oh, oh, there I start to feel some vibrations. And then it just depends what quality I want. Oh, 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 there's all kinds of variations depending on what song I'm singing, what part of my range I'm in. But when I made those different vowel variations, I felt the placement shift. And so if you are, you know, wanting to find some variations of placement, Kristen, what you're really looking to do is, as long as the vocal folds are vibrating correctly, is to start playing around with vowel modification. So if we spread our lips and uh, smile into the sound, we're going to get a brighter vowel quality. Ah, and that's going to give you a different sense of placement. If you round your lips and drop your jaw, oh, you're going to get a rounder vowel quality. Okay. Uh, if you're trying to belt, uh, or sing more pop or rock styles or country styles, you're usually going to go more towards that brighter quality, that ah based quality versus an O oh based quality. If you're singing in a choir or you're singing classical music of some sort, that O oh or O oh based quality is going to give you the warmth that classical singers look for. And then as you continue to develop what we call the balance of the bright and the dark, or they call it in Italian uh, chiaro scuro, as we find the balance in classical singing, you will be able to have both warmth to your voice and some ring and, uh, you know, find forward placement sensations that are useful for you to make that sound. Now, the last thing I want to point out, Kristen, is not everybody feels forward placement sensations. I would say at any given time, about 25% of my students, if you ask them, would tell you that they do not feel much when they sing. They're aware of the sound differences. Um, they're aware of like physical sensations of moving uh, the jaw, the tongue, or the lips, or in the respiratory system, or even in the learning of the laryngeal level. But uh, vibrations in their facial structure, in their bones, their face, or the mask, they don't feel anything. I just had a conversation with this uh, uh, topic with a student earlier this week. And so if you're one of those people who doesn't feel anything, that's fine. You're probably going to be able to make better identifications of the shifts you're making uh, with visualization or by listening. So don't feel like you have to have any kind of um, vibratory placement sensations. And most importantly, don't try to copy someone else's. All of our facial structures are different. I mean, look at Mike and I here on the screen. Mike and I got very different shaped heads, right? And we got different voices. Mine's heavier and lower. His is higher, more tenery, more marketable, all those things. And uh, so when Mike goes to make certain resonance adjustments, he is going to, you know, feel things differently than I am in my part of the range. So I would never want to try to tell Mike how to sing with my placement and Mike's not going to try to tell me to sing with his. What each of us have done is try to find our own placement for the different styles of sing, uh, songs that we sing. And uh, Kristen, what I want to do is encourage you to do the same. Find the placement that works for you. Great. Um, I'll just leave one other thing. Sometimes if, you, if you're not, I'm totally against, I would say totally against forward placement. Don't force it. You should yeah. never force the voice anywhere. But I do remember early on in my training, my teachers would tell me you have a droopy face. <laughs> so sometimes you you know, you do sometimes have to try to allow the right facial sensations to help stimulate, yeah. you know, uh, the right outcome that you want, but yeah, don't be lazy guys. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. All right. So let's go into our next question. Uh, this one's from Nelson Nelson. Hey, thanks for tuning in and writing in. We always love your questions. So this one comes in as a man ascends past F4, what needs to be done to keep the folds connected? And should you feel anything in the throat? Good. All right. So as far as should you feel anything in the throat, let's start there. Because we were just talking about it with placement. Um, it's going to vary person to person. You know, some singers are hyper aware of what they feel in their throat. Uh, they make a teeny adjustment and they, they feel it. Other singers don't feel anything. I would say the more experienced you get and the more freedom you get into your singing voice, we would expect that you would feel less and less. But a lot of times when you're trying out new sounds, you're going to be hyper aware. Your brain is focused on what you're doing. Pardon me. Um, the thing that we definitely don't want is we don't want any feeling of a grunt. So if you feel like your voice is going, Aah! sometimes you're getting that grunty quality, then that's a problem. And that's that's not good. But if it feels kind of like uh, if you were calling out to somebody, so going, hey, hey, and it has that kind of a, a sensation, 
then that's normal uh, for most people. You know, you could, still could be making some uh, constriction, but more than likely, if it's like one of those calls or a sigh, you're in a good spot. And any sensations you're feeling are just sensations of awareness of your body performing this function or vibrational sensations that you feel around the larynx. Again, everybody's different. Now, what you're uh, asking about is what we call in Italian the passaggio, and that's the changing point. Uh, of where the vocal folds shift which muscle is dominant in that moment. So we have one muscle that helps shorten the vocal folds. It's called the thyroretinoid muscle, and it's a muscle that runs right through the vocal folds. We have another muscle called the cricothyroid muscle, and it is one that when it contracts, it helps elongate the vocal folds. And when it elongates the vocal folds, that's what's going to give you high notes. Uh, and when you're elongated and you're coming down for low notes, that muscle has to transition over to the muscle inside the vocal folds to switch into lower pitches. These, both of these muscles are active throughout your entire range of your singing voice, so they're always involved. Um, you also have a ligament that runs through the vocal folds, and when we hit this passaggio point, the ligament is starting to take over some of the length control functions in your vocal folds. That sounds a little complicated, but... Let's say up to around F, you've been able to hold on to that muscle in your vocal folds really tight and your head voice muscle, the cricothyroid muscle has been pulling it long. But once you get to a certain point, this muscle needs to start letting go and you need to let the ligament be the thing that starts to control how far you stretch that vocal fold. And that's where people run into trouble with a crack in their voice or a break in their voice is that they are not transitioning over and allowing the ligament to take uh, the lead. And so, Nelson, what I want to say for you is we're going to want to try to get your vocal ligament to be the thing that uh, uh, takes over there. And the easiest way to do that is to start in head register. So, Matt, one, one thing I just want to say, the, the term that jumps to mind for me is called pulling chest. Yeah. So, you know, if you carry the chest above, like too, too high above that F4, you're definitely going to be pulling chest. You won't have done what you're about to explain, which is how do you let the register shift happen? Yeah, exactly. Right. So okay. the first thing is what we want to do, Nelson, is we want to start in really letting it be that cricothyroid muscle, the muscle that pulls the vocal folds long, and the vocal ligament being the two things that are active and changing pitch. To do that, we want to go up into the upper part of your range, and we don't want to try to be uh, pushing really loud and high. We just want to use a light, breathy quality. That light breath equality is going to, again, like to get your body to realize that ligament can be involved. We're just going to carry that down. You can take it as low as it'll go into your voice, okay? Because what we're doing there, we took that way below that F that you're asking about, that F4. But by taking it lower than F4, we're getting your body to realize that, oh, I don't have to engage the thyroarytenoid muscle there. Usually when people are pulling chest, what Mike uh, is uh, you know, talking about is they're getting their vocal folds in that firm place in the lower part of the range, ma, 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 and they're trying to take that all the way up, ma, and they hit a ceiling. And so if that's, uh, you know, happening, your body thinks it has to always have that TA muscle involved to make sound. So by getting this light, uh, what some will call falsetto quality and carrying it down as low as possible, you're giving your brain uh, signals that there's another option. So then what we want to do is go into your regular modal voice or your speech-like voice, that ma, 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 ma. And we want to start getting your body the ability to thin out from that point. Because what you're having a problem of getting past F4 is you're not able to thin out uh, the vocal folds, right? They're really thick and pressed together. What we want to do is take off some of that pressure on the midline so as they vibrate, they're not as firmly pressed together. So we're going to take a single pitch and we're going to start off with a really firm sound and we're going to slowly de uh, decrease the amount of vibration in the sound until it goes breathy on us. So it's going to sound like this. Here we go. Ah. So that process, which can seem really simple, can actually be quite complicated for a lot of singers. Right? It doesn't end up being as easy as people think it's going to be. So do it until you can uh, easily get from that firm sound to that light sound. Then after you can get from firm to light, then I want to go from that light breathy back to buzzy. 
Once you can do that, we're then going to transition back and forth between the two. So we're going to start really full, go to breathy, and then breathy full. So. Uh, so that's training your body to decrease the pressure on the vocal folds themselves. Now, we just did that because we're going to start to go back up into the uh, difficult range, uh, this passaggio point. But instead of just keeping the same sound, we're going to take that exercise we just did and apply it onto the glide. So we're going to feel like we start really firm, and then we're going to lighten up, and then we're going to get firm and buzzy again. Ah. do that up and down throughout your range when you get up to like this f area it's going to feel real fragile real unstable now i've had laryngitis this week i don't even know if i can phone it up there we're gonna see but um i'm gonna give it a shot but you're gonna hear regardless it's going to shake on me a little bit because it's just out of shape right now especially with the sickness ah <laughs> that's an instability right but if i'm not sick it should just kind of be this light quality that goes up and comes back down, okay? What you're going to want to then do once you start getting the ability to lighten up that, that much around that F, that F sharp, the G, you're then going to lighten up only as much as you need to to get the sound that you're looking for. So instead of doing the extreme lightening, I'm going to start to look for places in the middle. Ah. as I keep working up, <coughs> you know, I have had a COVID test. It's not COVID, but it's not fun, whatever it is. But um, when you're going we're, up. We're sorry. We're feeling for you. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, at least I talked today. Yesterday was iffy. But um, when you're doing that dragon, you're doing that glide and going up to the top, uh, if you keep doing this day in and day out, this process of carrying that head range really down, getting the blend exercises going, and then carrying that up on a fifth, you're going to start to find out all the different registration configurations you can do on those pitches, and specifically the F, the F sharp, and the G. And then what you're going to want to do is start playing around with your vocal track and try to dis uh, discern if maybe your vocal track is getting in the way somehow, if maybe that's what the issue is. And so we want to make sure that your larynx isn't going up too much. So if you start hearing a wah-wah sound coming in, uh, we're going to want to make sure that we can get that larynx down a little bit more like a hoo-hoo sound, okay? So to get more of that neutral hoo-hoo or oh, or whatever your speaking voice sounds like, maybe we're going to first want to swing everything to the extreme opposite. So that's uh, you know, sipping a string of spaghetti and then vocalizing from there. Ah, 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 that gets your larynx down. And sometimes when you go up for those high notes, ah, 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 that lower larynx makes it easier to get up there. Depends what style of song you're singing, right? That's more of a classical sound or a legit music theater sound. Uh, for a pop rock sound, we wouldn't want that much weight. But then again, my voice type doesn't really lend itself towards those high pop rock sounds, right? And so that is the other thing we haven't touched on yet. But, you know, all of this is dependent on your voice type. Uh, if you're not a tenor, you're not necessarily going to be able to do these exercises much past a G and A flat and A. Uh, if you're a low bass, you may find that this F is still, you know, really difficult. So you always got to honor what your natural physiology is, your uh, body's makeup. I was going to speak about that too, Mac. I'm glad you brought it up. And and that's just simply that, you know, you're mentioning F4 right now, yeah. but the I hate the term passaggio, but this part where we have to transition between the break, uh, you know, to, to have a wide range um, that, you know, it's largely confused or misunderstood and it is challenging for some singers out there. Um, but that is, you know, the points that it starts at can vary by at least like a major third. I mean, it could oh, yeah. be as low as E flat. It could be a D, right? That someone start going, that note's too high for me. If you have a really low voice. Um, likewise, it could be as high as a G where yep. you... 
you can go you can go even higher so um and i think i wanted to point out you know you're mentioning in your in the exercises where you flip and i think it's important that when a singer's trying to work on this you don't want to stay locked in yes. either one voice whether it's don't keep working on your full voice or your chest voice and don't likewise don't work in the falsetto the whole time you definitely need to some exercise that you're saying whether it's top down or low notes to high notes back to low notes that get your voice to understand oh i can do the same note with multiple configurations yeah so you're not necessarily trying to confuse your body but you're trying to give your body those choices and yeah. I, i'm i'm glad you mentioned that so also if you've got one of the these exercises aren't working that's where a coach can help you guys okay so and i'm done not just saying whether it's a coach here on voicelessons.com or it's your local neighborhood a singing instructor um, sometimes the exercises match sharing, these might be ones that work for him or his students, but they might not work for you out there. So go ahead and try them, but you might not be able to do a siren or, or a sigh on a fifth. You might be, unfortunately, one of the lucky ones that can only do a major second. Yep. And so you have to practice that and you have to go, okay, this is where I am and I need to know where to start. And it's okay to understand that it's a humbling experience, but getting started is like that first step. And that's where understanding what exercises do I need to do and in what part of my voice should I be working on them in. And it's rarely the same for anyone. There will definitely be some singers where it's very close. But, you know, so, guys, you got to understand that we're trying to give you generalizations. But don't be what if you're out there watching this and trying these at home, go, that one doesn't work for me. It probably needs a different one. But yeah. we're after the same goal. And the same physiological change, the same functional change. Yeah. Yeah, there's a way that I do this as well with vowels of going from closed E vowels that have a hint of nasality inside of them for some singers. It was just actually doing that with somebody today. Somebody who was trained as a classical singer and who now is crossing over. And uh, as she's working on crossing over, her vowels always default to really dark and it always gets her stuck. So we're going more towards more of a bright nasally vowel because that nasally vowel is actually getting her closer to speech like mix. And because she's a trained classical singer, even though it sounds nasal to her, it's not actually nasal. It's just what we would call twangy. But it's just so different for her. That terminology works for her. And then, you know, I've got another student that if I ever said nasal to her, it would make everything worse because her voice already sounds a little bit that way and she's already self-conscious about it, right? So, you know, again, there's three different students who all have three different things that they're doing and I'm meeting with somebody tomorrow that I'm going to be doing this work on, uh, you know, with a variation of helping them continue to develop their belt voice. So, you know, great points for Mike. Um, but, you know, the, so the, you're looking at your larynx on the vocal track. You want to make sure on that spectrum we've talked about before between an NG sound where the palate's down or a, a hootie oo or hootie ah, ah, where the palate's up. We want to see where you are in there. You may need to put a little bit more ah into the vowel when you get to that F4, or you might need to put a little bit more ha ah into the vowel when you get that F4. Uh, your jaw might need to open more, or you might be opening your mouth up too much. Uh, you might need to bring your lips back in a smile more, or you might need to bring them forward in more of an ooh shape. And so all of those things, Nelson, as you make those resonance adjustments, are actually going to change the way that air travels through your vocal tract, which means that air is going to be ricocheted backwards in different ways, which will also impact the way that your vocal folds close. So, yeah. you know, that's why if you were watching this show and you're like, this is complicated, well, it is. But once you start doing the work, uh, it becomes way less complicated and you start realizing over the course of several months that, oh, this is pretty easy. You just got to do the work. You got to the understanding of the concepts is easy. You just got to keep doing the practicing and finding what variations work best for you. Yeah, you just um, made me think of one other thing that sometimes gets overlooked when someone's trying to get through, get to the higher notes. And you mentioned chiaroscuro, but open and close. And sometimes if the vowel shape, if you wind up on a path where the vowel shape closes down too soon and you don't have it open enough, you won't have anything to actually turn. Yep. So you've, you'll cut you'll cut your voice off, right? You'll limit the range. So you might potentially, you could be on that F4 um, and singing a vowel that's already kind of turned, if you will. And then you just have nowhere to go except squeeze and push and yep. that's just not going to work 
So yeah. that's where like you do need some audible feedback. So if you're at home trying these on your own, you definitely can make progress, but sometimes you might want to check up and go, Hey, this is what I'm doing on this note. Why isn't it working? And that's where a trained coach is going to have the ears and the know-how to make recommendations for you. Yeah. Excellent. Awesome. awesome. Okay. Let's jump into our next one. This one comes in from Caitlin. Um, hi, Caitlin. Thanks for watching. How do I practice using my diaphragm more? Whoa. Can we, can we unpack this one? Yes. That's okay. uh, when I saw it come in, I thought that was a perfect one to go into today. Uh, so I'm going to actually, I'm going to hide it here for a minute, Caitlin. <coughs> so we can look at this body over here. So this is Patty LeBone. Uh, my students named them and uh, I think it's a fitting name. And uh, Patty lets us uh, be able to get some insight, literally inside of the body, of how the voice works. And I think that's just critical is that you have an accurate map of how your body functions. Because if you don't, you could be doing all kinds of things that are counterproductive because your body doesn't actually function that way. So let's first talk about where the diaphragm is located. This is the rib cage that you're seeing here. Now, these are the front of the ribs. These are what are called the costal cartilages down here. And the diaphragm actually runs all along the bottom edge of these costal cartilages. And then it domes up on the inside, right? This is what's called the xiphoid process. So we go up around these costal cartilages. It pokes up a little bit behind that. And then it's coming back down on this side. And then it wraps around all the way into the back, following the bottom of the rib cage. Now, it's a dome-shaped muscle, just like this dome that you're seeing here. And if you notice, there's some stuff down here underneath of it. This is what we call the viscera, all right? And the viscera has got things like the liver, the stomach. We have the large and small intestines. The kidneys are in there too. And a lot of people think their diaphragm's in their stomach because when this diaphragm contracts, it flattens. And when it flattens, the first thing it hits is the viscera. And it pushes down on the viscera, and the viscera usually goes a little bit more out to the front and sides. Depends on how strong your abdominal wall is, okay? So if I remove a lung here, Lungs are always a little sticky you now. Got a little wiggle on. There we go. So uh, here's the lung, and now you're going to see the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is this muscle right here, a dome-shaped muscle. And you can see it's really thin. It's like one or two millimeters thick. It's much less than people think. If you hold it in between your fingers, you can rub your fingers together, and you can feel your finger on the other side of the diaphragm. It's not so thick that you can't realize that your hand's on the other side. Now, right underneath, or right above of your diaphragm. So here's the outline of the diaphragm right here on Patty. You're gonna notice right above, it's the heart. And so sometimes if you feel like when you're breathing and your heart's pounding, you gotta realize these things next to each other. So you're breathing and heaving in and out, you're putting pressure up and down and moving things around your heart, okay? Let's pull out the other lung. And you're gonna see that the lungs themselves actually go up higher than a lot of people think. They go all the way up here behind your sternum. That was where the sternum was, right there. So if you find your sternum, that's the top of your lungs. Now, when you inhale, again, this diaphragm, now you can see the whole thing. Move the heart out of the way. Running out of places to put body parts. Um, we uh, see the top of the diaphragm right here. And like I said, it's going to push down on the liver. Now, if I remove the liver, you're going to get to see the back of the diaphragm. So let's do that. And there's the back part. It's we won't tell them about the professor you buried in the backyard. Yeah, right? <laughs> take away a little bit more. Well, was that the student? I can't remember. Yeah. So take away that. Now, if you ever feel like you get a, a real burpy when you're trying to sing, you're uh, you know, practicing. Well, this is why. What Your esophagus right here actually comes down through the diaphragm and goes right into the stomach over here. So if you eat before you sing, which is what we tell people not to do, but if you do it anyway, and, uh, and you're bringing your diaphragm down to take full breaths to do that, you're going to be pushing down on the stomach and agitating all the contents inside of the stomach, and that can give you the burps. Now, it makes exact perfect. So you got the big Diet Coke. You know, you went to you went to 7-Eleven. You got the 64-ounce Big Gulp, you know, for 99 cents. And now you're singing, and then it just it pushes down on it. And there yeah. you go. All right. It causes your problems. So then if we get the intestines out of here as well and pull out the rest of this, we can see the back part of the diaphragm in its full glory. So, so would you say would you say everyone has to sing from their diaphragm? You you can't sing 
and not well, from your that's diaphragm. the next part of this which okay. is what the diaphragm does <laughs> okay. the diaphragm contracts and when it contracts it pulls downward so it starts down here you can see how it connects into these uh, thoracic vertebrae in the back so these are the right in here it was your spinal column right okay well the diaphragm connects down to the thoracic vertebrae and when it contracts it pulls the diaphragm down towards the lower vertebrae. After it's contracted, the only thing it can do if you relax it is return to its resting position, which is up. So if you are breathing at all, if you're taking a breath and successfully being able to bring air into your lungs and then successfully releasing air out of your lungs, you are using your diaphragm. There's nothing else to do. You're using it. And this is one of these singer's terms that just gets misused. People say, sing from the diaphragm. Well, you already are. Everybody is. If you're not singing from the diaphragm, we need to get you to a hospital because we got a <laughs> massive dysfunction that's actually in the way. Hey, chat us in the chat if, you're, if you can feel your diaphragm or if you're not breathing, please chat us too so we can dial 911 for you. So yes. <laughs> All right. But so it, it's always active. So when we're singing, we're not actually doing anything with the diaphragm. We're leaving it alone. What you're doing something with are the muscles that run in between the ribs. So I'm going to put your lung back in here. Those are the, the inner intercostals or intercostal, intercostal muscles. Okay. All right. Inner. So they go in between. They're these muscles that you can see right down here. And we have two of them. We have one set that originates. That means that's where the muscle starts. So the diaphragm comes down here at the thoracic uh, vertebrae. It originates there. Then it arches up and then it pulls downwards towards its origination point. Well, the muscles that are on the bottom edge of the rim, the uh, rib that originate here, they insert into the bottom rib. And when they contract, they pull the bottom rib towards the upper rib. And those are the muscles that you use to inhale. And those are infinitely more important than the diaphragm. The diaphragm is going to take care of itself. But if you let these muscles contract, breathe in, and then just release them, the other set of muscles called the inner intercostal muscles are going to take over. Those muscles originate on the upper edge of each rib and they insert into the bottom edge and when they contract they try to pull the upper rib down so when we are you know quote unquote uh trying to use the diaphragm what we're actually trying to do is control the rate of release of those external intercostal muscles and the rate at which the rib cage comes back into its resting place so put your hands on your side of your ribs and I want you to breathe in. So this is the resist the collapse part? This is the resist the collapse the part. External inner cost, co costal muscles. Yep, costal, inner costal rib. muscles. Okay, you yes, guys. The inner good. rib muscles. That's all okay. it is. They're, just, they're literally and it's called inner rib muscles. holding the ribs down. Yeah, so what we want to do is when we inhale, the muscles, the external ones are engaged. What we want to do as we sing is try to keep the external ones engaged and slowly allow the rib cage to return to its resting position. Now, you don't want it to get fixed and rigid, right? You don't want it to be there. In fact, when we had Dr. Kari Reagan on the show, she mentioned the idea of a buoyant rib cage. And I like that idea a lot. You think about buoys out in the water, they're always bouncing. Well, when you're singing, this is always bouncing. But when we keep that rib cage up, it slows the diaphragm from relaxing which is going to slow the release of air. Now, depending on the style of music you're singing, the length of the phrase you're singing, the registration that you're in, and your age, there are all kinds of variations of what we need to do. Or if you have a microphone. Right, or if you have a mic, exactly. <laughs> if you're in an opera house and you're a soprano and you really want your voice to carry, you're probably going to contract the abdominal wall to push it in on the viscera to help speed up the relaxation of the diaphragm to try to get more air out of your lungs so you can get that big full operatic sound. Meanwhile, you're you're resisting the collapse. You're resisting the collapse, right? But there's a study that was done in Nashville of some Grammy Award winning country singers and they didn't do anything different than when they speak. So on the flip side, you're going to find award winning performers who don't do much with the respiratory system. They just kind of let it do what it does. So we have to remember that everything lives on this spectrum between uh, high control and low control, right? Or high management, low management. A lot of singers, songwriters, pop artists, they're on that low management side, especially if they're doing a lot of ballads or a lot of light singing. Uh, they don't need to do any fancy uh, level of control. 
Now, if you're a musical theater or a classical performer, you're in that high involvement side, highly active respiratory muscles, because you got to be able to get through some pretty strenuous singing activities in a show. And you need to have a really fine tuned uh, motor system connection to the respiratory mechanism so you can make variations along the way. Awesome. So, wow, we went deep into uh, the diaphragm there. So how do I practice? I think that's the question. How do I practice using it? Great. So what I want you to do, Caitlin, is first of all, just realize you're already using it. I want you to breathe. And as you breathe, I want you to feel like you're relaxing your abdominal muscles. We want to feel like we breathe in and this can relax. Now, I've got a lot, a, a lot more here to relax than other people do. Some people have more. <laughs> So whatever you have to relax, let it relax as well, we're, right? We're not laughing at you. That's okay. I'm <laughs> two kids in. And, you know, kids affect everybody. Um, yeah. So we've got, uh, yeah, dad's gotten a, a little. Dad a bun, dad yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm proud of it. But um, you're going to relax those abdominal muscles and you're going to let the air expand into that abdominal cavity. Now, if you've got really firm six pack of abs, this ain't going to happen. You're not going to feel any expansion here. Those muscles are too strong. So in that instance, instead, you're going to mainly focus on the ribs going out and feeling that the lower rib cage expands outwards. And again, that's going to help you get the abdom or the uh, diaphragm to descend. So after you've taken, you know, a breath that's appropriate for your body type, you're then going to practice on keeping that rib cage out while hissing. So you're just going to maintain expansion. <sighs> You can do it on anything that you want to. And what you're just doing in that moment is you're teaching those external intercostal muscles to stay engaged to keep your rib cage up. And then as your body releases air, the lungs deflate. As they deflate, the rib cage is going to collapse inward. And you're going to notice that no matter what you do, your ribs are going in. So that's what I mean by don't get rigid. Don't fight it. Let them come in naturally. Just don't let them go whoop and heave in right away. I was just working with one of my uh, singers today. And uh, he works out, he's got great abs, and as soon as he breathes in, it goes, and it crunches right down, and his high notes get super pressurized. As soon as you have him lift his arms up and sing, which starts to disengage some of these abdominal muscles, his high notes just fly out, right? So that's what we're avoiding. We're avoiding the compression that happens when those ab muscles kick in. Yeah, I got a tip. You got to give him uh, his next lesson. Make sure that, ask him when he does his bicep curls or his tricep curls, make sure he hisses. Instead then, of holding. Yeah, if, if he's if he's grunting, you know, while he's doing the curls or something like that, then that just means he's basically training at the gym to hold it. Oh, you gotta breathe. You gotta breathe when you're exercising. Yeah, we should get an exercise expert on here one night to talk because I mean, all the things that people do at the gym that are harming their voice, they have no idea. That's yeah. a really good point. We should uh, we'll put that. Yeah, on. You gotta do like a twelve count and blow out while you're doing those. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Good. Good. So um so yeah, but you're gonna do that to the hits. And then what you're going to do is at the end of that hiss, when you feel like it's weakening, that's when you're going to start to contract your abdominal wall. And in contracting your abdominal wall at that moment, you're going to try to then, what essentially what happens is the abdominal, uh, the rectus abdominis muscle, as well as the transverse oblique muscles, they connect onto the rib cage. And so when you start um, engaging your core muscles, they start pulling the rib cage down towards the pubic bone, which further compresses the air in the lungs, sending it out. So that's where abdominal engagement can help. So, Caitlin, I would just start there. It's really, I think a lot of times it's made out to be way more complicated than it actually is. If you think about it, I said it, I gave you a full evidence-based, fact-based answer. But essentially, the diaphragm helps you inhale and your rib muscles help you control the exhale. That's Great. simple, right? Awesome. So keep the rib cage up and out and let it come in naturally. And if you need to give it a little bit of gas, the gas pedal is your abdominal wall. Firm up your abs as if you were doing a crunch. And as you start to firm up those abs, just like when you do a crunch, it pulls your rib cage towards your pubic bone. When you do a crunch while standing, it's going to try to produce that action. But since it can't, it's just going to put a downward pressure on the lung, on the rib cage, which will put more pressure on the lungs, sending air up and through your vocal tract. Great, great. Okay, Caitlin, hopefully that helps you, gives you a really good explanation of what's going on and how you can practice 
using your diaphragm more. So let's go to our next question. Well, we this got a couple in the chat, and I think we're going to have to wrap it up oh. for this evening. Okay, gotcha. All right, let me These go. These are a couple good ones. So let's, uh, Sarah, let me get Sarah's first. Okay, hit it. Are you hissing out? Should you engage the tummy muscles when you start to need it? So let me, um, what you want to do is essentially, I'll just stand to do this again, Sarah, is that you're going to keep everything expanded out. So you're going to just keep releasing air now. As you notice, as I release air, this starts to come in a little bit. My rib cage does too. And when I starts coming down at the end is when I'm going to start contracting and firming up those ab muscles to get the rest of that air out. Right? So on the hiss, it's... And I'm doing a condensed version of it because I can hold that hiss for 15, 20, 30 seconds. Um, and I just want to just sit here just staring at me doing that. But um, that's that kind of an idea. You start off just kind of keeping everything out. And then you slowly start engaging it a little bit to keep the hiss going. And then start engaging it more and more as needed to keep the strength of the hiss throughout. Now, when we're singing a uh, sustained note, what we're going to be listening for is does the volume or uh, tone quality or pitch change. So if I sustain a note and it's just ma, and that's all I have to do, nothing really changed. So I don't really need my abs. Ma takes care of itself. But let's say I had to hold it out three times as long. Somewhere along the range, I'm gonna start watching that pitch go down. Ma, it's going to try to get flat. <laughs> You're flat. Yeah. As it gets flat, that's an, a cue that I need to engage my abdominal wall. Ah, to get enough air pressure to get it to go back up. So that's cue number one. If you start losing volume, let's say it comes out and it starts at a volume eight and a few measures in, you're all the way creeping down towards a volume five. Well, you want to start engaging that abdominal wall. So as soon as you start noticing it. So if you're at eight and you feel it trying to creep towards seven, slowly contract that abdominal wall to give yourself a little bit more breath pressure. Because essentially what we're trying to do is level out the breath pressure as we sink, right? If we didn't do anything with our abdominal wall and we only kept the ribs up, we would get a good strong release at the beginning of a phrase. But then as we used up the air in our lungs, the pressure would try to drop. Right? The more air that's in your lungs, the higher the pressure. So as the air is released, the lower the pressure is going to go. And that's why we then engage these abs. We engage the abs to get the pressure to go back up so we can get a level line or a level curve of the pressure over a long term of singing a phrase or a sustained pitch. All right. Awesome. One extra thought I was going to add to that is if you do have, I remember for, for me, well, way back when I had a much firmer tummy, um, sometimes I had, my teachers told me to push out on my epigastrum. Mm -hmm. And so I did engage a little bit at the beginning. Cause if I didn't, my ab, like there was no, the abs were too strong. Yep. Um, and this was, you know, decades ago. So, but, um, you know, you may have to find, depending on your body type that you have to breathe differently or engage differently. Cause I think you're describing a little bit more of a, Okay, I just breathe and go and I resist, I resist, resist at the external intercostal and I don't engage the tummy till the very end versus another singer may have to yeah. already be resisting it from the beginning. Yeah, that's a really good point, Mike. And I think a lot of it comes too with voice type. So again, if you're a soprano, you're more likely going to need because sopranos have more air releasing than like a, a baritone or a tenor does because the vocal fold configuration is different. And so they're going to use more air. They're going to need to do a different approach. They may need to get the air moving a little bit more with the, that immediately. We also have to remember that uh, respiratory capacity changes with age. So somebody who's 20 years old is going to feel their breath very differently than somebody who's 60 years old. And the person who's 60 years old might very likely have to engage their abdominal wall pretty much immediately when singing to have enough pressure. Whereas if the 20 year old uh, engages their abdominal wall immediately, it could overpressurize everything and cause them to push. Right, they could, they could have too much and then they're out in 10 seconds versus if they take the passive approach, they could get 20 seconds of air capacity. So some yeah. of it's gonna be a little bit of an experimentation, sir, and hopefully you have a coach you're working with. Um, you know, but if you don't, maybe you can just let us know, like how are, what is your current engagement? What do you currently do? Do you find that you need to start when you hiss, do you start with an engage? Then do you then bring it in or what are you, what are you doing? So let's jump to our next question. Yep. 
so this one came in from Bryce. We'll make this the last question here because we got plenty to talk about with this. Uh, if anybody else pops in, if there's short questions, we can take some live ones. Um, Maestro, he said, I have a question uh, regarding tenors and low notes. I'm a fairly high voice tenor and haven't really had much trouble hanging out above the passaggio. You lucky, lucky, lucky tenor. I wish I was a tenor if you didn't know that, Bryce. Um, on the lower end, I'm typically bottoming out somewhere around C sharp to D sharp consistently and uh, cannot seem to find a viable strategy for navigating this part of my voice. Any tips? I do. So first of all, what I'm going to tell you, Bryce. That might be the bottom of the voice. <laughs> it just might be the bottom of your voice. So see, you got lucky and you can sing all the way up through the passaggio, through the stratosphere, the place the rest of us mortals have had to struggle with for years. <laughs> And those of us who are sitting here with those low notes are looking at you and going, really? And uh, I, I understand the pain because we all have notes we want to get. Yeah, I was just but, joking uh, <laughs> that before the show, Bryce. So, like, I, ba I barely will have a B flat or a B, maybe a C, maybe a C. So I'm maybe not as light as you, but if you have a lighter voice, you may not have a big bottom, but you, but you want to make sure you at least have a nice, firm, consistent low C sharp if that's what you have. Yeah. I think you said Pavarotti or, you know, some of the lyric tenors, they they never perform below a D. Yeah. They used to, you know, keep it. Again, every voice is different. Now, Bryce, I am going to give you actually something to go do, though. Or okay. just tease and, you know, this is bar us baritones. Give him a, a lesson. All right. I'll give you something you can actually do. So let's go to the first note that we know is working consistently for you. And it sounds mm. like it's probably the E, uh, if you feel like you're bottoming out. So E mm. or the F. And the first thing I want to do is I just want to in, uh, increase and strengthen the closure of your vocal folds. And one mm -hmm. of the easiest ways to do that is just with staccati that awaken them first. Mm -hmm. So this is going to awaken the muscles that snap those vocal folds together. Ha, 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 ha. And we're going to do that. And then we're going to start to take that down. Ha, 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 ha. Now, this is the note that you say is a little weak. So what you're going to do down there is you're going to see if – Doing, after you've done some of these in the notes above. So I would play around with like four or five notes above the one that's the problem. And then when you eventually get down there, see what comes out. Ha, 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 ha. If you have any tone that's starting to come out, then do it again. Ha, 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 ha. Then do the one above it. Ha, 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 ha. And do the one that you're struggling with. Ha, 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 ha. And maybe try another one. Ha, 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 ha. And go to the other one that was up one. Ha, 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 ha. And just alternate between these. You're going to do that for about three to five minutes. Okay? Just really awakening. Oh, I was going to add one thing here. One thing yeah. here. Bryce, you may want to do this first thing in the morning. Okay? As a, ah, light tenor, as a light tenor, some of the best, one of my teachers said, okay, if you're going to work the low notes, do it right, roll right out of bed and go right over to the piano. Hopefully you don't have roommates or, you know, parents who can wake them up, but you know, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., right in the morning, your voice is going to be a couple notes lower and you're going to find that you can access this chest voice a little quicker. Yeah, absolutely. So now after you've done those staccati, which is again, waking up the muscles. If you want to know the specific muscles, it's the inner arytenoid and the lateral cricoarytenoid muscle that we're really getting to engage. Okay. Then the next thing that we're going to do is what I call chest voice planks or low note planks, right? And on these, we are just going to hold the successful notes as long as possible, right? It's those, you know, just like uh, there used to be, I think it's isometric exercises. I mean, that's what a plank is, where you just like hold the position. You know, you lift up the, you know, the dumbbell and hold it or hold a, a, a curl halfway. And just the act of holding it would start to strengthen the muscle as the muscle tried to just hold on and bear that weight. So we're going to do those kind of isometric exercises for the voice by just getting on these low notes and holding them as long as you can. Okay. So if I'm down at my bottom of my range, I'll go down there so you can start to hear the little struggles that'll show up. Uh... Now you notice that got buzzier the longer I held it. One of the things that tells me is, is I took too big of a breath at the beginning. I had more air in my lungs than the vocal folds could handle. Mm -hmm. So on this next plank, I'm going to do 80% of my breath. Mm -hmm. uh... You're just going to hold it as long as you can. 
You're going to start this maybe a whole step, maybe a minor third above uh, where the low note problem is. So you're strengthening the notes before it and then getting to the note that you're actually wanting to deal with, right? Just kind of like you're not going to go to the gym and just uh, sit down and do 200 uh, you know, push-ups or 200 pounds on a bench press, you're going to slowly build up to that. We don't need to just jump right onto the treble note. Let's get your body working well and the notes leading to it. Now, while you're uh, playing on each one of these low notes, you can also then start to make some resonance adjustments to see what happens if I bring my lips forward, bring them back. If I close my mouth, if I open my mouth, if I widen my tongue, if I just don't even think about my tongue, if I try to lift my palate more, if I just let it be. Are there any resonance adjustments while sustaining the pitch that make it easier or louder? So you heard there that there was some that started to clean it up. I'm catching myself doing bad neck stuff as I'm sitting here, uh, you know, on the camera and talking to the computer. So you also want to check neck things. Uh, and you go to the next one. Uh, and that's where I'm bottoming out. That's probably where your D sharp and C sharp are, somewhere around that range. So then what we're going to do is we're going to try to do a downward exercise path. So, ah. Uh, Just trying to get the voice used to working in that part of the range. Again, I'm making any breath adjustments. What happens if I do 50% of the breath? <sighs> and asking, was that any better than if I took a full breath? Yeah, that full breath's actually messing with that low note. So then I'll try it again at 50 so i'm finding for myself that to get my lowest notes today i need less air oh, oh this is getting stuck now i'm, I'm going to try to see what happens if i do it with a darker vowel like a hootie o vowel oh and it's just not there today uh, usually that is one of my bottom notes or the E below it. But like I said, I've been fighting. I've had laryngitis earlier this week, so I'm not surprised that those notes aren't there. But what I would do is just start keeping track of how much time I'm practicing down there with those exercises and then see if they eventually do get stronger. So I'm talking with all these things maybe 10 minutes a day. Uh, you know, if you start feeling fatigued before 10 minutes, then, you know, pause, stop. We don't want you singing until you're hoarse. But, you know, over the course of six to eight weeks, we should start to get a better idea whether those notes are just your physiological limit or if you just lack the coordination to hold the vocal folds together that low in your range. Or if your respiratory system is overpowering the vocal folds, so they're just giving up, which is why they were getting weak on you. Or if it was a resonance adjustment that you needed to make. And so play around taking those qualities into that lower part, those chest voice planks, and then that three, two, one, two, three, two, one pattern to work that out. And again, give it about six to eight weeks. And if in six to eight weeks from now, you have a better D sharp or a better D, awesome, it worked. If not, keep seeking other people's advice and other people's opinions. There's some other exercises we could do. But I think this is, I, I usually on the show try to get what I think is gonna work for 90% of people. And then, you know, start there. And if it doesn't, you can look for some other things. And if you have tried other people's approaches, other methods or their strategies, and you're still not getting what you want, then that's probably just what your voice is. And uh, the benefit of it is, is that you have high notes I will never have. <laughs> and uh, the negative part of it is, is there may be like two or three songs that are annoying to you because you don't have those low notes that you need. But, uh, you know, I'll take the high notes any day. <laughs> <laughs> and Bryce, I would say being a light tenor myself, I know what Matt's saying, like staccatos for sure and working one or two pitches, even though it's monotonous, yeah. it's literally like doing the bench press or the squats at the gym. And ah, uh, you know, ah, A1 or ah, ah to a dark ah, those vowels tend to be a little bit easier to access. Do it in the morning 
and just give it a few, like you said, eight weeks, six weeks, just doing those staccatos. And you may have, I don't know necessarily a mixed registration, but you may not have a pure a chest voice yet. You may yeah. have just been flying super high in a nice mix and a nice head voice. And you have yet to discover what a pure chest voice is. And it could just be, you got to go down there and work on that part and it will show up for sure. Yeah. And one other thing to do that, as you mentioned, when you do that R ah, one of those darker vowels, make sure that it's not your tongue getting involved. Because a lot of times people go, oh, 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 and they're pulling their tongue down. as they're they the tongue to make the note, the yeah. Right. Yeah. So the main thing is, is to remember that low notes are going to sound low because they're low. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, if you just try to let them out of your body, you're going to get whatever quality is best for you. Mm -hmm. So if I try to muffle and make a dark sound like I think my low notes should sound like, oh, I bottom out. Versus if I just let it come out, oh, there it is. It's usually there when I don't have the other problem. <laughs> but if something will come out, right? But you hear that it didn't die off as fast either. So we want to just let it out. Don't try to hold it in and make it dark. Because the holding it in to make it dark will make you lose those notes. But letting it out will usually release them and set them free. And the benefit of having a really strong chest voice anchored, it's actually going to make your top voice even stronger. Yeah. You know, because you're essentially strengthening the opposite end of the instrument. So um, I think that's it for today. I think, we, we, you know, we got a couple questions we're going to push to next week. But I'd say, hey, everybody, thanks for tuning in. It's been a great show. Have a wonderful week. And uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah, see you next week. Good night. All right, take care.